Let's continue. Please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. This morning we are going to learn the topic walk after the Spirit. Walk after the Spirit. <coughs> Romans 8, 1, we shall read all the way to Romans 11. In fact, it would be probably good to read more. Why don't we read then a little bit more up to verse 16? Okay, I won't cover all of those verses, but it would help us to put things in context and see the truths concerning walking after the Holy Spirit. Okay, we shall read responsively these 16 verses. There is therefore now no condemnation to them, that, to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. <coughs> For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Let's pray. Lord, we come to Thee that we may receive Thy blessings in the study of Thy Word. Thank You for the wonderful feast that we have on Thy table. Thank You for the, for the bread of life the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. Thank you for helping us to meditate upon thy word this morning and helping thy servant to preach the word faithfully. We rejoice that thou art a wonderful shepherd who feeds us according to his grace and goodness and also according to our needs. Thou hast spoken to us throughout this camp. Thou hast not disappointed us. Thou hast not left us to fend for ourselves. But thou hast prepared a table before even our enemies. The devil is after us. The world is after us. The unbelieving people are after us. The disobedient Christians also trouble us. But thy word that thou hast prepared is so wonderful. And we shall feed on it 
even as we come now. May you help us, O Lord, by thy Spirit. May you teach us how to walk after the Spirit. This is our prayer. Please answer us in Jesus' name. Amen. Walk after the Holy Spirit. Verse 1 of Romans 8 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse 4 says, That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The first 16 verses that we read speaks of the Spirit's ministry in the believer's life. And what does it provide for us? This is an amazing life. The life in Christ is life in His Spirit. Jesus Christ is not with us physically, but his presence is granted to us by his Spirit. How do you know, practically, that you are truly saved? It's not a concept, it's not a theory. It is a truth. It is the truth in doctrine and in practice. You see, the wonderful thing about Christian theology is that it is down to earth. That is to say, it is given to bless us in our earthly life. It's not a matter of academic discussion. I know people think this way because Christians generally made the mistake of making theology a uh, high tower experience of the theologians in seminaries. I'm very, very fed up with that thinking, honestly. I'm a man who thinks that theology ought to be discussed in the church and not in seminary professors' department. It's for you and me. And that's why we encourage Far Eastern Bible College students to be thoroughly uh, scriptural and theological in the teaching of members. And we ourselves, uh, I mean the lecturers in FEBC, are all pastors. We don't bring in anyone who is not a pastor to teach theology and doctrines and the books and the languages of the Bible. Uh, because we believe the truth can be experienced. And it is, the truth is the life of God's people. Even the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, it is a very high doctrine. It requires your heart and mind and strength in all its fullness. You can't approach these doctrines with half-hearted, lackluster attitude. You've got to give yourself 100% to understand. And there should not be any corner of your mind that is not filled with the doctrines of God. Our minds must be completely renewed by the Holy Spirit and His truth. And so, Apostle Paul helps us in this particular passage to see that this Holy and high truths of God are made real to us by the working of the Holy Spirit, the divine teacher whom God sent to be with us. He proceeded from the Father and the Son, as Jesus himself taught us in John's Gospel, that he may magnify the Father and the Son in us, that he may teach us to walk with God, on earth. That's why the Holy Spirit is with us. He takes the 
most difficult doctrines and teach to teach them to us that we may receive it with accuracy <clears throat> so don't let anybody influence you and say oh doctrines are not what we need but love now love that doesn't come from doctrine is not divine love it's carnal love it's fleshly love. You keep treating people according to their desire. No, we cannot treat people according to what they want. We have to treat people according to God's expectations. And so it is very significant that we must live by the Spirit. Because if not, we will be exercising our own flesh. So we are told twice in this passage, walk not after the flesh. But what? After the Spirit. He is real. He is here. He is within us and He is among us. He is with us. There will not be a day where you, have, you will have to live without the Spirit. He is ever present with us. And so, let's pay attention to the details here. Firstly, remember this, everyone who is saved, delivered out of condemnation, has the presence of the Holy Spirit. And not just that, their salvation is evidenced by the fact that they walk after the Spirit. If you say, I'm saved, but you do not walk after the Spirit, your claim is false. Verse 1 says it all. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now, who are these people who are no, not under condemnation? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and His death and His resurrection shall be saved from the condemnation of their sins. There is therefore now <clears throat> no condemnation. This is a result of complete divine provision which Christ has made available for us on the cross. He has done what it takes to have redemption and justification. We are justified no more condemned. We are declared not guilty because Christ took our sins. So by taking our punishment on himself, he has liberated us from God's wrath, wrath that was against us. No more wrath. Now let me explain this verse very quickly. The fifth word in the first sentence of this chapter, which is no, is actually the very first word of this chapter in the Greek text. When Paul first wrote, he started this chapter with the word no. And the Greek word is just made up of two letters, O, U. O. <laughs> That's how we began this chapter. Th this word, who is not the normal word for no. The normal word is ude, O U D E. But this is the strongest negation in Greek language available. He didn't go for the normal no, but he go for an emphatic no. And he plays it right at the beginning of the sentence so you know that it is a big no. And what is that? No condemnation, he says. Wow. You see, Apostle Paul just finished talking about the struggles of a Christian in chapter 7. 
he talked about the struggle that he himself experienced in his flesh. He talks about the law of the flesh versus the law of God. And he says he is sometimes struggling with it. Now, you see, that's not his pre-conversion experience. It's all written in present tense. And that means chapter 7 is talking about his Christian battle. The war that is fighting within him as an apostle. As a great servant of Christ. Apostle Paul struggled with sin. He calls it the law of sin that is at work in my flesh. And he knew this is real. And so if you look at the last verse of verse 25, uh, chapter 7, that the preceding verse, Paul said this, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. He, what he is saying is a summary of all that he discussed in chapter 7, and it simply tells us the reality of Christian life. We who have trusted the Lord Jesus look for victory and we are assured of victory so we thank God through Jesus Christ that we can live above the sin that is present in this body. You see, we are still in our fallen body, right? We Christians have not given a new body yet. It, it will come. It will come when we meet with the Lord again at His coming. We will have a resurrection body which is untouched by sin. It is immortal, incorruptible body. And so, until then, we Christians, having a renewed spirit, live in this fallen body, which is marred with sin. So when we become Christians, our souls are renewed. It's liberated from the bondage of sin. And we are brought to love Jesus Christ. And love is law. Love is truth. <coughs> However, this body that we live in has all the impulses of sin, okay? Maybe it was a good pointer to you this morning when Reverend Joseph Poon told you that all these tests and temptations are left there to prove whether you truly love God. So we have this battle as a Christian. And this battle will be over when we see the Lord. Until then, we have to fight this fight. But don't you fear, just like Paul, you must say, thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when he comes to chapter 8, it tells us how we can overcome the battle against the flesh. And that's by walking after the Spirit, whom the Son and the Father sent to us. Are you clear on this? So, when you are struggling, you feel just as chapter 7, verse 25 says. Well, I'm a Christian, I thank God. But why is this struggle? In my mind, in my renewed mind, I know I must serve the Lord. But in the body, the sin is always present. So my body wants to serve sin, but my changed heart, my renewed mind. You see, when the Bible uses words like heart, mind, conscience, all these are faculties of your soul. Just like you have hands and legs and nose and ears for your body, which are the faculties of the body, you, the soul also has faculties. Emotion belongs to the soul, not to the body, right? So when the body and soul are separated, the body doesn't feel anything. It can't understand anything because the soul is removed. So understanding, convictions, feelings, all this belong to our soul. Okay, so when the Bible says, with my mind I will serve the Lord, it's saying that with my soul I love the Lord. But the struggle is that while we are on this earth, our soul is within this body and we experience the fight. So I want to bring a good news to you. Do you feel the fight? That means you are Christian. If you don't feel the fight, I'm sorry, you are not Christian yet. 
because you want to serve sin and you don't feel that you must serve God. But if you are saved through the Lord Jesus Christ, it's absolutely clear. I can't serve this body. I must serve my Lord. Because your heart is saved, liberated. And so when we come to chapter 8, Paul says, there is therefore. What is this therefore? Because of fight. You know you have no condemnation because you are liberated. And you want to please your God. But if you don't have that reality being experienced, then something is wrong. That means you are still in your sin. Better repent. <clears throat> now what will a Christian who has the struggle do? Well, he rejoice the fact that he is no more condemned. And then, Apostle Paul here tells us in verse 1, he will walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh, which is still full of sin, have the impulses of sin. So let's rejoice in that, that there is no damnatory sentence against us who have trusted Jesus, whose hearts are turned toward God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said this very clearly. Just a quick reminder to you. John chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Jesus said, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he that not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. The light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ who is the light of the world, you will not love the evil of this world, but you love the light of Christ. And that tells you that you are saved. You're not under condemnation. Again, in John uh, 3, verse, sorry, John 5, 24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Now we're going to learn what this means, death unto life. It is not just that we are saved from hell to heaven, but we are going to live in the power of that life which is known as eternal life or abundant life or spiritual life and that's what the Holy Spirit is going to help us to rejoice in are you ready? do you like to walk after the spirit or you want to walk after the flesh? huh? how come you look very confused? <laughs> maybe I'm not wearing my glasses <laughs> Okay, now you're smiling. <laughs> Do you want to walk after the Spirit? Oh, I desperately want. I desperately want. You know why? Flesh is real. Sin is real. The battle is on every day. Everywhere. I want to please my Savior. I belong to Him. He saved me from my condemnation. I want to be a good dog. Not a bad one. And I call myself a barking dog. <laughs> well, we better be loyal to our master who saved us from the tyranny of sin, from the tyranny of the devil. The Lord has delivered us. And now he still won't let us go. He's still trying to catch us, the devil, through the flesh. And so Peter says that we must be careful because the war is raged against our soul by the flesh. Through the lust of the flesh, the war is raged against our soul. It's real, my brethren. We are walking in a minefield. In fact, we are living in a minefield. This flesh is completely ridden with lust of the flesh, which is contrary to the Holy Spirit and is low. Let's begin with this 
thanksgiving attitude. Therefore, there is no condemnation. Remember Charles Wesley's grand hymn, And can it be that I should gain? In that, there's a paragraph that goes like this. No condemnation, now I dread. I am my Lord's, he is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Let's begin there. No condemnation, now I dread. I'm going to fight. The Lord delivered me from my damnation. There is no death sentence against me anymore. But I'm going to live. I'm going to live like a child of God. And I'm going to live like a child who is adopted by God and given the spirit to cry unto him above Father every day. So, how are we going to do that? Now, to help you to understand this particular counsel from Apostle Paul, I need to strive to explain a few things at this moment. In verses 2 to 4, we will see the word law appearing again and again. In fact, there are three kinds of laws mentioned here. Three kinds of laws. Let's take a look. Let me read verses 2 to 4. And you must really understand these three kinds of laws you see here. For the law in the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Did you see two laws in that verse? What's the first law? The law of the spirit of life. What's the second law? The law of sin and death. They are opposing laws. And now, verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now what is this law in 3 and 4? The, what the law could not do and the righteousness of the law. What is it referring to? God's written law. The law of God written in the scriptures. For instance, the Ten Commandments. The law could not save us. The law bring us to Christ and say, look, here is the one who died for your sins. The law condemns us. The law convicts us of our sin and then points us to Christ. But it cannot save us because no one can fully uh, fulfill what the law says. So when we commit sin, the law becomes our judge, not our savior. The law judges us. But it helps us to point us to the savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So there are three laws that we have to face as a Christian, okay? As a Christian. If you are not a Christian, you have only two. <laughs> the law of sin and the law of God against your sin. But if you are a Christian, we praise God there is the law of the Spirit. Now, you need to understand, though the Greek word for all these three kinds of laws we experience is the same, namely nomos, they mean different, I mean, the same word can mean different things in different contexts. Now, when, <coughs> when we saw <coughs> the third kind of law, <coughs> it, it was a reference to the written law of God. But the law of the Spirit is the working of God, the principle of God, or the governance of God. You see, the word law can mean governing power. And so often in the book of Romans, the word nomos is used, not always in the sense of written law, but as 
governing Lord, ruling, guiding, taking control of you. So it has the idea of the principle of government. Are you with me? So there is this law of the Spirit, that means the governing power of the Holy Spirit, and also the law of sin, which is the governing power of sin. All right? Now, so you must understand these words clearly as we go forward. <coughs> now, since we have clearly seen that those who are delivered from the condemnation of God and brought into the life of Christ has to live a life of battle. And the way to make sure that you avoid all these governing powers of sin that work through the flesh, God has provided for you the Spirit of God in you to guide you. And let me show you the advantages of living by the law of the Spirit. Firstly, looking into verse 2, the beginning part of verse 2 says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So the first advantage is it frees us. The, spirit of, the law of the Spirit of life frees us from sin and death. If you are willing to yield yourself to the Holy Spirit whom God has given to us, you can be sure that you can find freedom from the sins that always molest you. You just have to say, Oh Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit whom thou hast given. And I thank thee for his presence. I thank thee for his reminders. I thank you for his encouragement and exhortation within my heart to follow the truth of God's word. And I want to listen to him. I want to yield myself to the Holy Spirit. You see, the scripture tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 5. That simply means be filled in the sense of being under the control of the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for fill is the filling of the wind on the sail of a boat. You know, when the wind blows and it, it fills this big piece of cloth that they put up, we call it sail, and the boat gets the energy to go forward. And it sets the direction also. It's not, the word, the word fill is not uh, water being poured into a cup and filling. That's not the idea. The idea of being under the governance of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means when the scripture says, be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. <coughs> so, when we are under such powerful control of the heaven's wind, even the Spirit, ah, through this raging sea of sinful emotions and desires and lust, he will help us to go forward in his path, heavenward. It frees us from all the downward pull of sin and help us to cut through. You can feel the temptation. It will come close. Sometimes it will hit you very hard. But you wake up and say, Lord, I'm sorry. It looks like I'm being pulled down and I can feel the water coming into the boat. But send me forward. Here I come. So when the Spirit of, con Spirit of God convicts you of your sin, you immediately rise up. You ask for forgiveness. And you give to him yourself again. And there you go forward. In verse 3 and 4, in verses 3 and 4, it actually tells us when you <clears throat> walk after the Spirit, 
you will also be able to fulfill the righteousness of law. The law, the law of God is nothing bad, it's good. It, it cannot save us. It is not meant to save us. But it, it tells us the need for salvation. And also it tells us how the believers should live. How God's children should live. This is a book of God's people. So when we are not God's people, it will condemn us. And so we come to Christ. And once we come to Christ and are saved, then the Holy Spirit say, okay, now live by this, because this is the book for God's people. Last time it condemned you because you were not God's people. Now it welcomes you and says, come, let me show you how to please God. Because this is written for you and me who are saved. And the Holy Spirit then gives us the understanding and the desire and the power to live by this. So you need Holy Spirit to help you to obey God's word. If you rely on your flesh, you're going to fail. So don't always say, I will do, trust me, pastor. You can trust me, you know, I'm pretty good. <laughs> Once I make up my mind, I will do it. No, I don't believe you, sir. Something wrong with you. <laughs> you must say, by the grace of God and by the help of the Holy Spirit, I will do it. And I thank God for the Holy Spirit. And that's what you read in verses 3 and 4. Take a look. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. You see, the law is weak through the flesh. In other words, we cannot fulfill the law by the flesh. The flesh is against the law. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law, remember? Righteousness of law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. So Jesus showed us how to live a perfect life, obedient life, because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He lived according to the Father's will in the power of the Holy Spirit, fulfilled every single jot and tittle of the law. Jesus said in Matthew 5, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He fulfilled it on our behalf, yes. All the ceremonial laws he has done it. All the moral law he has done it. Now we don't have to do the ceremonial law because Christ has fulfilled them. It all pointed to Christ as our Savior. But we must follow his righteousness. And his righteousness is in the moral law of God. And so the Holy Spirit help us to be like Christ in obeying God's law. How wonderful it is. We have Jesus as the example, Jesus our Savior as the example in obedience of the law. And then he gave his Holy Spirit to aid us in this walk. So it frees us from the power of sin and death. It enables us to fulfill the righteous law of God. How wonderful this is. Now I'm going to explain what it is to walk in the Spirit or walk after the Spirit. Okay, you have seen the advantages. Now listen to the explanation of what it takes to walk after the Spirit. How do we walk after the Spirit? Now we need to take a close look at some interesting phrases in this passage. Uh, the in the last part of verse 4, we read, Walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You see, the word walk is depictive of one's behavior. is customary uh, manner of life. How a person conduct himself in his life. And it has to be after. In fact, the Greek uh, preposition is kata. Kata means according to. So you must behave according to the Spirit. Not according to your feelings, as 
Reverend Joseph mentioned this morning, it's not your feeling that determines, but the Spirit of God. So who determines what I should say or what I should speak? The Holy Spirit. And who determines how I should, uh, how I should behave or conduct myself? The Holy Spirit. For a Christian, he has a counselor always standing by and he consults him. Please consult your heavenly counselor. He's ever ready to help you. Don't live a life without consulting the Spirit of God. In consultation with the Holy Spirit, Christians live. Commune with the Holy Spirit. So you must always come under the influ influence and the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means. Walk after the Holy Spirit. Coming under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Are you living that way? If you were not, that's why you faltered. You need the heavenly wind, even the Holy Spirit, to go through this tempestuous sea of sin and trial in this world. Yes, sometimes the sea may be very calm. You think you are moving very smoothly, but all of a sudden, the boisterous storm would come. Things will turn very ugly, and you get frightened. But heavenly spirit, that wind will come and take you through all these troubling circumstances that you are in. And you need to understand, because you are walking according to the Spirit, the second thing I want to emphasize is the fact that there must be a progressive reliance on the Holy Spirit. Not occasional. Continuous and progressive as the Spirit moves, you must move. You must keep step with the Holy Spirit. He is given to guide you, not to hold you down. And you are going to be more fruitful in time to come. You are going to be more victorious. You are going to be extremely useful for God's, God's kingdom. And you have got to examine this. Am I improving? Am I advancing? If it is not, not because Holy Spirit has abandoned me because I am not yielding to Him. It's very interesting, isn't it? That in verse 5, we are told what it means to walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Please look at this. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So this is walking after the flesh. I mean, sorry, walking after the Spirit. You don't listen to your flesh, but you listen to the things of the Spirit. Now let's think, what are the things of the Spirit? Now, things of the Spirit means that which pertains to the Spirit. That which is from the Spirit. It refers to all things that the Spirit has provided for Christians. Can you name some of them, please? Spirit-given things in your life. Oh, boy. I think the children in my wife's class are more excited. <laughs> okay. I'm sure this is the problem of being old, right? Why do you ask me this kind of question? Of course I know. But I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Never mind. So let me fill in the blanks for you. What are the things of the Spirit? Can you help me? Gives you the power not to sin. Gives you? The power 
The power not to sin, yes. Some more? The Bible. The Bible is inspired of the Spirit, right? It's Spirit's book. Do you agree? So you, you walk after the things of the Spirit, according to the Bible, you can say. What more? According to the doctrines, all the doctrines in the Bible. More? The spiritual gifts. Do you have spiritual gifts? Some people say, I don't have. <laughs> Do you have the gift of the Holy Spirit? Okay. Those who are Christians but no gift of the Spirit, put up your hand. Okay. So you all know your gift. Are you, are you seeking to fulfill them? Very important question. Are you seeking to fulfill the gift that God has given to you? You know, you say, I don't know what is my gift. How to find out what's a gift? Let me make it very simple for you. No need to do any, any lab test. You know, I had a teacher long ago in FEBC who tried to help us to find our spiritual gifts. And he came with about 70 questions. You know, and then you got to, uh, you got to answer them and he will give you one to five to see you know, where you stand. So do you have a short temperedness? One to five, you mark for yourself. Do you like to uh, listen to people? Okay, one to five, where do you belong? At the end, you know, when we add up, all the ladies in the class can be pastors and all the men cannot be. <laughs> because they say they are gentle, they like to listen to people, they, they are patient and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, men wrote there, no, I'm not so patient. <laughs> I'm... Uh, I, I can't be waiting for people, you know. Uh, and so, ultimately, according to that, what is called self-evaluation test, uh, you have, you know, a man cannot be a pastor, only ladies can be pastor. Now, please, put that thing away. That's not from the Holy Spirit. That is drafted by some ungodly minds, and they adapted, or rather adopted for the church. Now, this is what they do, you know. A lot of people take the worldly stuff and change the name and make it Christian. They sort of baptize the thing with some Christian name and bring it into the church and make you think that is from God. That's not how you test what, whether you have Holy Spirit or whether you have the gift of the Spirit. You firstly believe you have the gift because God said every man will be given a gift by the, by the Spirit. It's in 1 Corinthians 12. So what is the gift? Gift is the ability to serve to take care of one another in the church, right? So when you come to church, by the way, if you always sleep in the, ch in the house, even on the Lord's Day, you're not going to find out what your gift is. Because if you want to know the gift, you've got to come where the body is, where the church is. And then you look at the members, then you see the need. You understand? If my hand is cut off from this body and place it there, and my, this left hand is feeling itchy, but it cannot reach. And you look for the right hand, it's not there. The right hand cannot understand my left hand is having some trouble. But if it is attached to the body, it knows where the trouble is. I don't have, left hand has to come and say, hey, right hand, wake up, come and help me. No, the moment the itch is felt here, this one will go. Immediate. Because you are connected. So if you are a true Christian, you cannot be sleeping in the, uh, in the house on the Lord's day. The Spirit of God will wake you up from there. Say, go to church. Or maybe send a brother, say, hey, why are you not coming? Come on! And you feel guilty. And say, okay, I'm coming. Thank you for calling me. Right? And you come. When you come, you look. Hey, there's a brother. Uh, he's having difficulty walking. Uncle Bernie. Okay. Oh, he has no trouble. I think he can help me to walk better. <laughs> He's very strong. But anyway, there's someone who is in need. 
immediately you react. And that's your gift. What's a gift? Helping somebody to walk. Eh? That's not in the Bible. No, there is the gift of help. The Bible gives cat- names of the categories of gifts. It doesn't give you all the details. There's a gift to edify others. It can be preaching. It can be exhorting. It can be praying with someone. It can be a Sunday school teaching. Right? All that come under the gift of edifying. So there are many categories of gifts there. But when the Holy Spirit bring you to the church and let you see the things that you can by God's grace, help out. And that's your gift. And you see a brother who is struggling in life. He works hard, but yet he is in need. His wife is sick, his children are sick. He has, his income is not enough. But God has made you rich, wealthy enough, more than enough for your family. And the Lord moves your heart. And you quietly go and buy some food and necessary things for this brother, put in your car, and go to his house and give it to him. That's the gift of giving. You understand? But you need to look where the Spirit is looking. When the Spirit say, go to church, oh, I can sing also. God is everywhere. He is also on my, in my bedroom. <laughs> I can worship him here. You are being nonsensical. You are not listening to the Holy Spirit. You are speaking to your, you are listening to your own flesh. And then you argue according to your fleshly thinking. So what is walk after the Spirit? Seek the things pertaining to the Holy Spirit. Things that the Holy Spirit provided for you. The scripture, the spiritual gifts, right? The fellowship of the brethren is the Holy Spirit's gift. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. That's also a thing that belongs to the Holy Spirit. Comfort is not self-created. In Christians, it comes from the Spirit. So when you're sad, when you're troubled, you say, Father, thank you for thy Spirit. Oh, by thy Spirit, comfort me. Let him teach me things as I ought to think. You know, a lot of things, a lot of times we are very afraid and anxious and doubtful because we are not allowing our mind to think the way the Holy Spirit wants us to think. We are thinking according to the carnal realities of life. If I have a great financial need and I'm so worried, I say, oh, I must work on Sunday also so I can get this. What would the Holy Spirit say to you? Don't worry. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added. And you say, oh, praise God, the Spirit told me, yes, He will help me. I'm going to church. I'm not going to take a second job on Sunday. The Lord will help me. And your fear for financial need will just evaporate. And you see yourself increasing in the Lord's goodness. You may be tested a bit because the financial need is not going to go away immediately. It's going to be there. But you look at it not as a fear-stricken Christian, but as a confident Christian, as a man who is comforted by the Spirit. And I'm going to work hard from Monday to Saturday, and God will help me. If that's not enough, my God is good. He's able to provide in ways I do not know. But if it is going to be a period of test, the Lord will see me through it. Oh, Maybe I cannot send my son to school. I can't pay the school fee. Oh, no, son, let's pray. Maybe the Lord doesn't want your son to go to school. (gasps) Ah! Yes, yes, it's possible. It's possible. Don't say because everybody sends their children to school, my son also must go. There are many ways. What if your child is dumb? and deaf and blind. Still go to go to school like every other child? No. Different, isn't it? So is it possible that God can sometimes close the door in order to increase our faith and our assurance of His goodness? Oh yes! Oh yes! 
Well, I'm not saying don't send your children to school, please send them. But if it comes to a situation where you're so tried and troubled, don't give in to your carnal thinking. Think the way God wants. So often we are trying to seek the world. So often we are trying to please the world. And in that we lose the things of the Spirit. And so in verse 9, if you were to look at verse 9, you see this. Ye are not in the flesh, but what? In the Spirit. You see, that's walking in the Spirit. You are not in the flesh. You don't let your mind be controlled by the fleshly aspects of life. You look at everything spiritual. Do you know for Christians, nothing is to be worldly. Nothing is to be carnal. Nothing is to be physically bound. We are spiritual. Always. Even our work, we must look through spiritual eyes. Through God's word. Through the counsel of the Spirit of God. Everything. Our eating and drinking also must be for the glory of God, isn't it? So please learn to live in the Spirit. Learn, ladies, please learn to cook according to the Holy Spirit. Not according to Auntie next door. <laughs> now you go to church and you see there's a lady who brought so much food and so tasty. And your husband say, wow, that sister is so good. She cook all that. And you get jealous. <laughs> now my husband also praised that lady. <laughs> I'm going to cook. I'm going to buy all the things. You know. Now I'm go, go. <laughs> no. I'm not saying you shouldn't learn to cook. But then if you, your husband may not be so rich to buy all those nice stuff. So what do you do? You borrow money. Or you curse your husband. You know why I can't cook? Because of you. I can't even buy two eggs. I can only buy one for a day. You know? There are wives like that who are so discontent with the husband and because she has carnal aspirations. Once I overheard an elder's wife saying to the elder at the car park, what a shame. Look at our car. So old looking. Look at other elders' car. All very good. I'm quite embarrassed, you know. <laughs> Does BPCWA choose elders by the brand of the car? <laughs> cannot. You cannot think like this. You know, we pastors are also tempted. I look at Joseph's shoe, very nice, shiny. <laughs> I like... Uh, I look at Peter's shoe, not so good, okay, okay. <laughs> then I look at mine, okay. I go Reverend Jeffrey Koo, Reverend Dr. Quack, and I look at his watch, oh, this is nice, mine is, okay. <laughs> then I say, oh, you know, not good enough to preach well. I also must wear that, wear this. Why, why worry about it? Of course, I must be properly attired. I must be presentable. There's no question about it. But I'm not in a competition with anybody. If God gave my brother to dress, well, praise God. One young man once came to me. He's a doctor in my church. And he said, you know, Pastor Koshi, I like the way you preach and all that. But I pity you. I said, why? Um, why? You, you mean pastor rate is so bad? No, no, no. Uh, I said, then I asked him, if God call you, will you be a pastor? He said, I would think about it. But I don't want to be like you. I said, what, what's the problem? And then he said, I would be rather like Dr. Tog of Calvary Pandan. I said, why? Oh, because he was a medical doctor. He has lots of money. But look at you, you are very poor. <laughs> so if he want to be a pastor, he want to be a rich pastor, not a poor pastor. I'm not laughing at Dr. Tog. Then I said, brother, Dr. Toh has his struggles, even though he's wealthy. Thank God I don't have those struggles. It's not easy. God determines how a man should be. Why are you of jealous of this? I have the Holy Spirit, which money cannot give. 
I have things that money cannot give. So it's not a physical reality that determines whether I can have a victorious life or not. It is the awareness of what God provides through the Holy Spirit. True. I live not in a physical realm. Yes, I live in this world, but I am a child of God. I live in the kingdom of God. I, will, I live in the realities of the Spirit. Have you been living like this? If you don't, you cannot have victory. You will often be attacked by the devil and the world and pin you down. Because of this, we are told to mind the things of the Spirit. And in verse 6, we are told to be spiritually minded. You notice that phrase? Be spiritually minded. We must think like the Holy Spirit. Or think according to the Holy Spirit. And also in verse 9, you have the phrase, in the Spirit. So... We are to walk after the Spirit. We have to do the things of the Spirit. We have to be spiritual minded. We have to live in the realm of the Spirit, not in the realm of the world. We are not influenced by the world, but by the Spirit. Now, let me quickly, and my time is running off, or rather ran out, <laughs> tell you some wonderful benefits of walking in the Spirit or living in the Spirit. Benefits. First, I already mentioned this, but let me quickly mention this again. We'll be able to fulfill the righteousness of the law with the help of the Holy Spirit. You read that in verse 4, isn't it? This is what we read, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. <clears throat> Secondly, we can have a vibrant spiritual life, not a mediocre, unexcited spiritual life, but a very vibrant spiritual life. If you look at verse 6, it says like this, to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. To be spiritually minded is life. Life versus death. There's a big difference, right? We are living entities for God. We are not dead beings. In the kingdom of God, we are alive. We are alive unto things of God. The Greek word zoe, which means life, speaks of a very vibrant and vigorous living. Vibrous and vigorous living. Holy Spirit will never make you unexcited about things. If, the, if you listen to the Spirit of God, and the, if you are spiritually minded, you're going to have a very vibrant Christian life. You know, by the way, it doesn't mean all this show off. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, hi, hello, Pastor Kushi. And run around. There was one lady in my church, you know, she always screamed very loud. <laughs> and uh, when she sees me from far, hello, Pastor Kushi. I say, oh boy, here she comes. <laughs> of course, I won't say it loud, but in my heart, I say, better be careful, here she comes. <laughs> and she comes, she would just put her, she's very tall, and she would put her hand on my shoulder, hi, Pastor Kush, and squeeze my shoulder. How are you feeling today? Very glad to see you. Oh, man. <laughs> well, after a few times, I said, please don't squeeze my shoulder. <laughs> You can talk to me without squeezing. Oh, did I do something wrong? I said, yes. You can be loving, but no need to do this. If you have not thought that way, let me teach you. I appreciate you for your love and welcoming, but not this way. She's a married woman. I ask her, if a young girl in the church do this to your husband, should be okay. Should be okay. I understand that. <laughs> said, be careful. And she was not happy. But I left it to her to think. 
You know, the world's way of showing excitement, that's not spirit driven. You know, you laugh loud, you say things in certain way, or <clears throat> kiss four or five times. Now, nothing wrong, you know, if you're excited, greet one another with a holy kiss, but make it holy, <laughs> not worldly. You understand what I mean? It's going to be a vibrant life, but vibrant in the ways of God. Not by bringing in worldly excitement. What today people do in the name of the Holy Spirit is to make the world excited in the things of the world, not in the things of God. So they bring in lights, they bring in glittering stuff, they bring in the dance and the jumping around which is so carnal, they twist around, they, they speak with a worldly slant and all kinds of things. That's not what we are talking about. Please get it right. But a concern for righteousness, a concern for the things of God, a concern for service, a concern for the truth being taught, a concern to help those who are needy in the church. And we grow limitlessly, boundlessly in these things. You get it? That's the vibrant life. That's life. The life of God. To be like Christ, not to be like the world. A lot of churches are busy trying to make everybody think we are very good in worldly things. But let's show that we are getting closer to Christ by the Spirit. And also, you'll be benefited with a peaceful life, not only a vibrant life. If you walk in the Spirit, you will have peace from God because the same verse says us to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. A sense of security and safety in the Lord. The world may be full of trouble. Our life may have many trials. But we know all things will be taken care of by our God. And all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. So we sing, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. I lose my job. Thank God it cannot take away my heart from the kingdom of God. It is well. The Lord will help me. Oh, I'm sick. I'm terminally ill. Oh, it is well with my soul. The Lord will look after me. You know, I've been diabetic for probably 15, 16 years. And it's getting worse all the time. I'm trying all kinds of things. It's not getting better. I know there are people here also who are diabetic, struggling. It can be very depressing, you know. Every day you have to inject. And I throw away my insulin for two months already. I've not injected myself against doctor's advice. And I increase my exercise, control my food more, and I lost some weight uh, because I don't eat so much. And I don't know, I'm going to go back and have a good check and see whether I have to go back on insulin again. It's a big struggle. Sometimes it's terrible. And then I say, oh boy, I'm not a Singaporean citizen. I'm still an Indian citizen and Singapore PR. And recently they changed the uh, medical payment system. And PR, those who have permanent residence, uh, are not considered in the same level as the citizens. In the past, it was the same. But now, the permanent residents, have, people have to pay more. And each time I see a doctor, I come out, I have to pay $300. And the people there only have to pay maybe $30 or $40, who are citizens of the country. So I'm thinking of changing uh, my citizenship, but whether it is God's will, I'm not sure, so I'm still praying. Now, I don't want to go into those details. You can talk to me about it later. But, but I'm just trying to say, all this worries me. You know, I say, oh, all these years I work, what do I get? Will I have enough to survive? What if my leg has to be amputated? What if my kidney fails? If I have to go for dialysis? How? Oh, 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 I uh, better go and do some other job. You know, this church is not going to give me anything. You know, I don't have uh, insurance. 
Because in the beginning the church was so small, I wouldn't ask them for insurance. Now everybody who works with me in Gethsemane has insurance. We, the church buy for them. But I cannot get it because I'm diabetic. Unless I buy one with big premium. And I said, don't do that. So how? God is my insurer. I have perfect peace. I have perfect peace. When we started off as, uh, as preachers in the church, you know, my wife and I want to buy breakfast. We go to the coffee shop. We buy one cup of tea because we can't buy another one. And we share one cup of tea. And when my wife was pregnant, I used to get so concerned. I said, Lord, I can't even provide for my wife. How am I going to provide for my son? But now God gave me two more. And they all grown up, you see? And my first fellow is bigger than me. Did God provide or not? You know, I didn't say this story to collect money from you. No, don't do that. <laughs> I am well taken care of. Don't collect money for me, please. Don't do such things. Give to somebody else who is in need. I am fine. What? But there were moments, oh, hours and days and months of great struggle in the heart. But I know God promised. But how do I know? I listen to the Spirit who reminds me. I seek the Word of God. Once I look out through the window, I saw the birds picking up. The, the worms and I said Lord my children have no food literally this happened but the birds have worms but you told me to look at the birds so I'm looking where is the food two hours later somebody came and knocked at the door and said Pastor Koshi I said oh how do you know I'm living here it's from another church I've seen him only once in a camp and I said, brother, I forgot your name. I know you. Are you not from that church? Yes. Why did you come here? Can I help you? Oh, pastor, no. I was living on the second floor and his car was on the, in the car park. He said, oh, I have to leave. I have to leave. My wife is in the car. I just want to say hello to you. I came by this area and I knew you were living here. So I called my church office. I got your address. So I'm here. And he gave me an envelope. I prayed with him and he left. I opened up, there was $200. That was good enough for the rest of the month. In my life, I've gone through all this, whether it's sickness or financial need or great stress. Now a church is looking for $5 million by the end of this year. And we have only collected $1 million in the last six months. Now less than six months to go. Will God provide the rest of $4 million? We are fasting and praying because we have the assurance God will provide. And if you as an individual and as a family and as a church need to progress, you need peace that comes from God. The peace that passeth all understanding. It's not something that you get by the calculations of your mind. It doesn't come out of rationalization. It comes from the Spirit who teach you the promises of God that breaks every mathematical calculations and every, every logical deductions and places you in the realm of God who created all things and upholds all things. And there we find our peace. You get that? So if you are troubled, the Spirit will say, just remember, God is your Father and call Him what? Abba. So in your needs and troubles, you walk with the Spirit and you keep saying, Abba, Father, help me. Help me in this fight. And you will be living a God-pleasing life. Verses 7 and 8, quickly. Because a carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not, a, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So in the flesh you cannot please God, but in the spirit you can please God. Again, finally, you will have the assurance that you belong to God. Let's read verse 9 together in closing. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. 
Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So when you are led by the Holy Spirit, your joy that you belong to Christ will increase. You will say, now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Spirit will help you to sing as he leads you through. Let's pray. The joyful sound is the Lord is the help of his people. The Lord is their guide and help. If you know this, they shall walk. You know, Christians, you will not get stuck, okay? Remember the word walk also means you are progressing, you are advancing, you are overcoming all sorts of situations in different kind of terrains. We will move forward. People, you understand this? We will move forward. Don't worry about darkness that comes upon. Just look to Jesus. He will show you the light. He will show you the path.